And we're going to continue a sermon series we began about three weeks ago called Inside Out. Before we do that, uh, as you've already heard, today we're culminating a six-month celebration of our 50th anniversary as a church with barbecue and baptism down at the Pines. It's just uh, north of here on the right-hand side. We'd love for you to come be a part of that uh, today. And, uh, and we, you know, again, like they said, if you didn't sign up online, we had great response. We cooked enough for everybody to show up and, and more. So we'd love for you to join us. Three weeks ago, we started this series, Inside Out, and then we took off two weeks. One week, we celebrated in our services the 50th anniversary. And then last week, uh, Troy and Russ preached on small groups and the direction we're going in small groups. They were going to be shifting it a little bit to have ongoing groups and to have semester groups and uh, community groups and on-campus groups and affinity groups. And the reason we do that is because we believe transformation happens in small group. Look, you know, there's a time, what we practice here is basically the Greek model where everybody sits in rows and one person speaks. But Jesus practiced the Hebrew model where people sat in circles and they talked amongst each other. And that's really, you need both. And that's what the small groups are about. And Troy challenged many of you to step up and be small group leaders. The training for that will be this coming Wednesday at 6.30 on this campus. Just come in the lobby. We'll, it'll be clearly displayed where to go. And then uh, the next Sunday at 12.15, right after church, there'll be lunch served, uh, and there'll be training there. And what we want to do is equip you to be a small group leader, to go to your workplace, your community, your neighborhood, uh, an affinity group, the guys you play golf with, whatever it is, and to be able to do a small group with those people and invite others to come and join. And we really believe that's going to help us to, um, to reach more people, to see more transformation happening in the lives uh, of people. Like I said, we started this uh, three weeks ago, and we're back on it now for the next three weeks, and we titled it Inside Out. And the reason is because when you look at the Sermon on the Mount, which is Matthew 5, 6, and 7, it, and really it's the most powerful message ever preached, Jesus' teaching on, uh, in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, kind of the cliff notes of the gospel. And, and in the middle of that, Jesus makes these four statements. He says, when you give, when you pray, when you fast, and when you seek God first, He's, he tells us if we do that with the right motives and the right heart, that God's going to reward you for doing that. See, God's not interested in outward displays. What he wants is inward transformation. And that if we change on the inside, it will naturally change the way we live on the outside. And that's why this is called Inside Out. Three weeks ago, we looked at when Jesus said, when you pray, here's what Jesus said, go into your closet and pray to your father who is unseen. And when you pray to your father in your closet with the right motive, the right heart, he's going to hear you and he's going to reward you. And that reward may come in many different ways. It may come in just experiencing his presence in your prayer time. It may come through answered prayer. It may even come through him really revealing his will to your life or exposing that, that the thing you're praying for really isn't the best thing and he would lead you in another way. But you're going to experience God. And why does he say to go in your closet? He's addressing the hypocrisy of the religious leaders who would go out in the streets and pray publicly just so everybody could look at them and say, man, look how religious, look how pious that person is. And Jesus says, I'm not interested in outward expression. I want an inward transformation in people's lives. And so today we're looking at the second of these four, and we find it starting in verse 16 of Matthew chapter 6, and I thought, what better week to, to preach on fasting than when we're going to leave here and eat Brazilian barbecue, okay? <laughs> so we're going to look at the topic of fasting today, and, uh, and what we're going to see is that fasting is saying no to the flesh so that we can say yes to the Spirit. 
And, and quite honestly, I believe of all of them that if you will practice this one, you will see God do some amazing things in your lives. Look at verse 16 of Matthew chapter 6. Jesus says, now when you fast, all right, stop right there. Notice, he didn't say if you fast. He said when you fast. And it's a shame, but fasting's become a lost discipline in Christianity. And my hope and prayer is that we bring it back because it really is power. There's power available through fasting. We're going to talk about that in just a few minutes. But Jesus says, when you fast, he goes on to say, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces and show men that they are fasting. So the religious leaders of Jesus' day, the, the Pharisees, uh, they would basically go out in the streets and say, woe is me, I'm on my third day of my fast, look at how religious I am. And, and they, you know, because they were doing it to get the praise of people. And so Jesus says, don't be like the hypocrites. He says, notice this, he says, I tell you the truth, they've received every reward they're going to get. Now, all they're going to get is praise from people, and that's not what, uh, what God wants from me. And then we pick up verse 16. It's in your notes. It's up here on the screen. Starting at verse 16, he says, But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, so that it will not be obvious to men that you're fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And we'll look at what those rewards are in just a minute. But, but uh, the Bible clearly teaches that we're to fast and that there is a special power in fasting. Many of you know the story of uh, Jesus and a mountaintop experience we had, that he had. We call it the Mount of Transfiguration. One day Jesus took his three closest apostles, his inner circle, Peter, James, and John. They went up to the top of a mountain, and it says that when they got up there, this cloud kind of enveloped them. And then all of a sudden, there's Moses and Elijah. They show up. And what's amazing as I read that story is that the apostles just take it in stride. You know, in fact, Peter thinks it's so cool. He said, Lord, why don't I just build some structures? We'll stay up here for a while. This is neat. Now, I don't know about you, but two dead people show up, and I'm freaking out. But they didn't even freak out about it. Uh, and, and, you know, it's amazing as you read that story. By the way, Moses representing the law, Elijah representing the prophets, Jesus representing the new covenant. We don't know what was said in that meeting. All we know is that God sent Elijah and Moses probably to encourage Jesus. And, uh, and so they had this meeting. And then, as they're meeting, all of a sudden, God speaks audibly. And he basically repeats what he said at Jesus' baptism. He said, now this is my son who, I'm loved, who I love. I'm well pleased with him. Do what he says. And what's amazing is that the moment that God spoke audibly, the, the Bible says all three apostles just fell down shaking which gives us just a little bit of a hint of, uh, of how awesome and powerful God is. That these three apostles can look at two dead guys and no big deal. You know, even celebrate, let's, let's build a tent, let's, let's hang out for a while. But the moment that God spoke, man, they fell down trembling at the voice of God. And Jesus lifted them up and reassured them. And then they started coming down. They came down from the mountain. And after this mountaintop experience, they come to a crowd. And there's a commotion going on. And a, a father comes out. And he comes to Jesus. And he falls on his knees before Jesus. And he said, you know, Jesus, I brought my son who's demon-possessed to your apostles to heal him. And they couldn't heal him. They couldn't cast out the demons. And this is a destructive demon. This demon throws my child into the, tries to throw my child into fire and, and, and into the water to drown him. And said, it's a demon that's trying to destroy my son. And, and will you heal him? And Jesus cast out the demon. A little bit later, Jesus is sitting with his 12 apostles. And, and one of the nine who were down there said, um, Lord, why, why couldn't we do that? Why couldn't we cast out that demon? And Jesus' answer was, well, that kind, to do that, it takes faith. In fact, it takes a different kind of faith. He said, this kind of faith only comes through prayer and 
fasting. She said, look, the only way you're going to have the kind of faith to do that is through prayer and fasting. And here's what Jesus was telling them. He was saying the reason you're, you're so weak in your faith is because you're too connected to the world and you're not connected enough to God. Think about this. Prayer connects us to God and fasting disconnects us from the world. And Jesus is saying, the only way you'll ever have that kind of faith is through prayer and fasting. And so in your notes, why do we fast? Well, obviously, the reason we fast is we want to connect with God and disconnect with the world. We want to connect more with God and disconnect with the world. When I'm fasting, I'm disconnecting with the things of my flesh so that I can connect more with the Spirit. Fasting is reminding my flesh it doesn't call the shots. I don't live to satisfy the flesh. I live to serve God. In fact, Jesus, right before he began his public ministry, he went into the wilderness and fasted for 40 days. Now, Satan was tempting him during this time, but, but three of those temptations are listed in Matthew chapter 4. And the first one was the, the lure of the flesh in food. And Satan said, look, why don't you just turn these stones into bread? And Jesus, you know, Satan said, I know you're hungry. I know what the flesh is doing. Why don't you just turn these stones into bread? And Jesus said, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Here's what Jesus was telling Satan. He was saying, listen, this is about spiritual food that you know nothing about. It's about me connecting with my father in such a way to prepare me for the ministry that, that he has for me. And so we need to understand that fasting disconnects us from the pull of the flesh and, and from the pull of the world, and it connects us to God. The next truth in your notes is you can pray without fasting, but you can't fast without praying. We're to pray on a regular basis, pray daily, pray without ceasing, and, and, and we, you know, we can pray no matter what. But, if you've, but you really can't fast, a biblical fast, without praying because the purpose of fasting is to connect with God. In fact, I'd say this. If you're fasting and not praying, that's called a diet. <laughs> and it's a pretty terrible diet, right? Jenny Craig, Weight Watchers, they figured it out. Go to them, all right? Uh, fasting's not to lose weight. Fasting is to connect with God. So when you fast... You should spend a lot of extra time in prayer, a lot of extra time in solitude, time in God's word, because you're seeking God on a deeper level. Now, there's no one fast that the Bible gives us instruction about, but the Bible has fasts all through that. And so, so let's, first of all, talk about two types of fasts that you find in the Bible. First of all, you see a complete fast. And this is where people will go without food for a period of time. A Jewish fast was that they would fast from sunrise to sunset, and they would go all day without eating, and, uh, and they would spend that day in prayer. They would really seek God more in that day. In the Bible, we see three-day fasts as, as one of the fasts. We see 40-day fast, And these fasts are where they go without food for 40 days, they would drink water and maybe some, some juice to go with it, but that's a complete fast. And then we actually see partial fasts in the Bible. This would be where you would say, you know, I'm going to fast one meal a day for the next 40 days. Or like Daniel and the three Hebrew um, young men, uh, when they were offered all of the king's food, they, they knew it was not in line with their diet regulations. And so they denied it and they fasted from the food of the king and only ate vegetables for, for the times that they were being trained and actually their time there. And, and so... So a partial fast would be where you give up a certain amount for, for spiritual purposes in order to seek God more. And I know we're not supposed to brag about fast, but I do need to share this with you because I'm so proud of it. For about 45 years now, I have fasted from English peas and beets. Huh? I mean, it's just it's released me to be able to do that. Um, 
So then how long do you fast? Well, again, the Bible doesn't give you a prescription on how long to fast. We've already said some is fasting a meal. Some it may be a day, maybe three days, maybe 40 days. What I would say is let the Holy Spirit lead you on the time of the fast that he's, that he's going to lead you to. Now, there's so much on fasting that we need to know that we don't have time to really talk about that we put a link on uh, our web, web page uh, that you can go to and get all of these resources. For those who are watching online today, right next to the live stream, there's a box that says resources, and you click on that, and that's where you'll find all of it. So as you go home, you can go on the website and look at this week, click on watch live, and then you'll see the box that says resources, go in there and you'll have all of those resources in that link. Before we move on, let me just say a couple other things about fasting before we talk about three things to fast about. One of the things that I believe is if Jesus were here today, he might, when he was, if he were going to teach again on fasting, he might tell us that what we really need is to fast from technology for a while. Think about this. If our goal is to disconnect from the world and to connect with God, he might say, you know what? Three-day fast from technology. Now, I know some of you, your blood pressure is going up. The moment I say that, I can't check Facebook for three days. I don't know what my neighbors are eating. How in the world can I do that, right? And you just would freak out. Because let me say this, technology distracts us far more, I think, in our culture today than food. And so what would it look like to disconnect from technology for a while? In fact, I have friends who are so, they're, they're pastors, leaders, and organizations that are so overwhelmed with how constantly plugged in we are and all that's going on that they're actually going to monasteries for weekends or week-long retreats just to disconnect. So, so let's not forget what the purpose of fasting is. It's to disconnect from the world because we're too connected with the world and to connect with God because we're not connected enough with him. And also, we're going to talk about three reasons to fast, but let me give you a fourth reason that's not in your notes. You may just fast because... You really don't have any need, but you want to just connect with God more. You just, you just want more of him and to seek him on a deeper level and to experience him. And, and your fast is not necessarily for anything specific other than just, God, I love you, and I want to be in your presence, and I want to feel your presence. And it may just be a, a fast of, of connecting with God and a fast of intimacy, of, of wanting to know him more and to draw closer to God. But here's what I can guarantee you. If you determine to fast, you will face spiritual warfare. Because we have an enemy that doesn't want you to connect intimately with God. And you will face spiritual warfare. Jesus spent 40 days preparing for his ministry and he was tempted. And in spiritual warfare, all 40 of those days. And so, when you go out of here, here's what's going to happen. Satan's going to give you every reason why you don't have to fast. Or you may decide to start to fast, and he's going to give you every reason to break your fast and not to do your fast. Because here's what I know. If you decide to fast, uh, depending on whether you've done this before, but if you've never done it before and, and the flesh has always got its way, about the end of the first day, you're going to think you're dying you're going to think, I will not wake up in the morning. I'm going to die in my sleep tonight because I went a whole day without eating. Let me tell you, we're not dying because of, of lack of food. We're dying because we're eating too much food. And we need to disconnect from that and remind the flesh it's not in charge. It doesn't call the shots. But you will face spiritual warfare. I heard about a pastor who had a big uh, worship experience going, that was going to happen in his church, and he decided to fast for a week to prepare for that. About the third day of that fast, he was in Walmart. And as he was shopping in Walmart, he heard over the loudspeaker, hot biscuits in the garden center. And he wrestled with it for a second. And he goes, 
well, God must want me to break my fast because he knows how much I love hot biscuits, right? Who could, so Lord, okay, I'm going to give in. I'm going to break my fast. So he goes to the garden center. He looks around for the hot biscuits and he can't find them anywhere. And finally goes up to one of the sales ladies and says, where in the world, I heard you announce this over the loudspeaker. Where in the world's the hot biscuits? She was confused for a second. Then she goes, oh, no, hibiscus for sale in the garden department. <laughs> Well, let me tell you, Satan will tempt you in any way he can to get you to break a fast. So let's talk about three reasons to fast. And you know, it's the first one, fast for preparation and for wisdom. Jesus, before he begins his public ministry, fast for 40 days. He was fasting to prepare for what was ahead in this next three-year ministry and, and wisdom from the Father. In Acts chapter 13, we see the leaders of the church of Jerusalem. Uh, they're in a season of prayer, fasting, and worship. Now, it doesn't indicate that there's any one thing that they're seeking, but, but they're just, they've seen the church grow. They, they've seen persecution in the church, and so... They're seeking God through prayer, fasting, and worship. And it says that as they're doing this, God speaks to them, which, by the way, if you've never heard the voice of God, let me encourage you to fast. God speaks to them and says, set aside Barnabas and Saul for the mission work that I uh, have for them. And it was clear, they all understood that that's where God was leading them through this time of prayer and fasting and worship. They continued prayer, fast, and worship, and then they laid their hands on Paul and Saul and Barnabas and sent them out. And because of that decision, the world was turned upside down. Paul became the greatest church planter. He and Barnabas went out and planted churches, and, and Paul wrote half of your New Testament. Barnabas uh, and Paul split in their mission and, and so Barnabas brought this young man, John Mark, alongside him, the same Mark who wrote our second gospel. And it's impossible to think what our world would be like today if it wasn't for that, those, that early church fasting and God speaking to them and saying, here's my plan, here's what I want you to do. Now, God's sovereign. He would have done what he wants to do in any way he wanted to do it. But that's the way he chose during their season of fasting, he speaks very clearly to the leaders. So let me ask you, what would it look like if you fasted and prayed before every major decision in your life? In March, I'll have been here 20 years, and in those 20 years, I've seen hundreds of families relocate because of job opportunities. And if I talk to them, here's one of the first things I say, well, what's God telling you? Because their answer is, Man, it's such a great opportunity. We're going to make so much more money. It's going to be awesome. Or I've always wanted to live there. And the question is, well, what's God telling you? And sometimes I get blank stares. What do you mean, what's God? I got an opportunity, and it's more money. Let me tell you, every opportunity is not a God opportunity. Satan will use what looks like good opportunities to destroy you. Now, of these hundreds of families who've moved, I can think of at least a couple dozen that when they were in our church, they were incredibly active, plugged in. Their kids were doing awesome in the, in the ministry of the church. Their marriage was great. They move, and guess what? They never connect with another church. And I find out some way to get in touch with them. We can, you know, come across, uh, you know, each other years later and find out that, man, they never found another church, never got plugged in. Maybe they're apathetic to the Lord, or even more than that. I can't tell you how many I know that had major incidents after they did that where um, a child strayed and, and was no longer following the Lord or an addiction in the family or a divorce. And, and Satan will use what looks like good opportunities to destroy your spiritual walk. What would happen if you prayed and fasted before every major decision and you didn't make that decision? Till you got a word from the Lord. What if every high school senior prayed and fasted about which college they should go to? What if we prayed and fasted? What if everybody prayed and fasted before they ever said, I do? 
What if you prayed and fasted before you determined what neighborhood or house you were going to live in? And you let the Lord lead you and direct you in all of those major decisions. Look, if Jesus needed to fast and pray before he began his public ministry, how much more do we need to seek God before significant decisions in our lives? This kind of faith comes only through prayer and fasting. A second reason to fast is victory over sin. Victory over sin. Look at what God says to the nation of Israel. Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with what? Fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your heart and not your garments. In other words, I'm not interested in outward displays. I want to know that you have a repentant heart. Return to the Lord your God. And I love this next verse. For he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. He relents from sending calamity. Over and over again through the nation of Israel, we would see that they were on fire for the Lord. And that over a period of time that they would wander away from the Lord and start to worship foreign idols or, or, or start to... Um, uh, to worship foreign gods and, and really no longer serving God. God would send his prophet who would warn them to repent and return back. Sometimes they did, most of the times they didn't. And then God would bring his discipline on the nation of Israel because God loves the, he disciplines those that he loves. And, and he might do that through a plague. He might do that through an invading army and that the nation of Israel would wake up and they would, return, they would look to God. They would realize their sins and many Many times, as a nation, they would fast and return back to God. And again, Jesus said, this kind of faith comes only through prayer and fasting. There may be a stronghold in your life, a sin that you've tried to kick for years and years and never been able to. It may very well be that the way to do that, the way to have victory is through prayer and fasting. Because let me tell you, the flesh wants what the flesh wants. And the longer we feed the flesh, the harder it is to break the stronghold of the flesh. And so Satan, we, we just get caught up in so many things. The flesh says, man, you've got to eat this. Or the flesh desires sex. Or the flesh desires anger or pride or laziness. And, and we appease the flesh and it leads to sin. Well, it doesn't mean we don't eat, but it does mean that, that whenever we seek God through prayer and fasting, he will give us victory over these areas of our lives. Here's what I discover. If I can go three days without eating, then that's a reminder the flesh ultimately isn't in charge and that I can say no once it's enough. And when I, whenever I go three days and I haven't lost my cool and my temper, I learn I can control my anger and that the flesh doesn't have to call that shot. When I go three days and, and um, I've humbled myself in that process, I learn then to walk more in the spirit and to walk in humility. And so the fast reminds my flesh that it isn't in charge, and we ask God to give us victory over the flesh. And so sometimes we fast for wisdom and direction. Sometimes we fast so we can have victory over sin, and sometimes we just fast for desperation. We fast out of desperation. Esther was a queen... And uh, she was the queen of the, uh, a queen, and, and she was a Jew living in the palace, but nobody in the palace knew she was a queen. The king had an um, advisor, top advisor named Haman. And Haman had this Jewish man who happened to be Esther's uncle, Mordecai, and Haman hated Mordecai and found out Mordecai was a Jew. So Haman goes to the king and really talks the king into signing an edict that all the Jews in the area would be killed. In the nation, that all the Jews would be killed. We're talking ethnic cleansing on steroids. And the king, not knowing what he was getting into, signed the edict to do that. 
Mordecai, the Jew, finds out, goes to his niece, Esther, who's the queen, and says, here's what Haman has talked the king into doing. Every Jew is going to be killed. And by the way, don't think just because you're living in the castle, you're going to live either. They're going to discover you're a Jew, and this law covers you too. And here's what we need to know. And that day, a queen could not just approach the king. In fact, if a queen approached the king and she hadn't been summoned to come to the king, it very much many times meant her life. Because you didn't go to the king. Even though she was the queen, she didn't have permission to go to the king unless she was invited to come. And so Mordecai is saying, you have to go tell the king what happened. And Esther's going, I could die. I mean, he hadn't summoned me. In fact, I hadn't been with the king in a while. And Mordecai, that's where he made the famous saying, well, who knows that you've been put in this position for such a time as this. And so here was Esther's response. Um, Esther responded to, to the king and said, in your notes, then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and do what? Fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day, and I and my maids will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it's against the law, and if I die, well, I die. And out of desperation to save her people, Esther says, call the nation of Israel to fast, the Jews here to fast. They fasted for three days. Esther approached the king, and not only did the king accept her, but uh, the Bible says that the king did it gladly. And through a series of events, uh, Mordecai's, uh, I mean, Haman's plot was revealed to the king. The king found a way to save the Jews, and here's what's so amazing. Mordecai, who's the Jew, now becomes the top advisor to the king, and Haman has been killed. And that, out of that desperation, they fasted before they went to the king. So let me ask you this. What are you desperate about? What are you desperate for? Maybe it's a child who's a prodigal right now. They've strayed and they're far away from God. Maybe it's a relationship that's falling apart. Maybe it's something that the doctor said. And man, there is a heavy load and you're desperate. This kind of faith comes by prayer and fasting. So here's our response. I'm calling us as a church to fast. But I'm not going to tell you what to fast for. That's the Holy Spirit's job. Maybe it's to fast for a nation that's in a mess. Maybe it's to fast for direction and, and wisdom and a major decision coming up. Maybe it's just a fast <clears throat> to draw closer to God. Maybe it's a fast to break a stronghold, a sin that's destroying you. Or maybe it's a fast of desperation, saying, God, I, I've got to have you. Whatever it is, don't let Satan talk you out of doing what God expects us to do. Jesus said, now, when you fast, let's make that a part of our spiritual law. Let's pray. Father, I know that this is a topic that's new to many. And yet, God, I know it's something that you um, expect. And it's one of the most powerful ways you can work in our lives. I pray that we will not be deceived and talked out of doing what you've called us to do. But, God, we would seek you and follow, uh, God, your, your instructions. That, God, we would see breakthroughs happen because of seeking you in a, in a powerful way through prayer and fasting. Marriages restored. Um, strongholds broken down. Prodigals returning. Joy where there was once desperation. And God, we know that you're planned for our lives, and so we, we seek that. And, Lord, help us to seek that through prayer and fasting, and guide us in that. So God, may your word uh, work powerfully in our lives as we walk in obedience, knowing that your promise is when we fast, if we do it with the right heart, we will be rewarded. 
And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.